But let me, let's get started. Today, last week we dealt with doctrine of the Word of God, and I'm actually going to spend a few minutes today finishing out the last two or three slides that I just went through last week, okay? Because there are a couple of important topics there that I want to finish up. And then we will deal today with the doctrine of God. Again, the reason that systematic theology begins with the doctrine of the Word of God, revelation in the Word of God, which we dealt with last week, is because where do we, from where do we get our knowledge of God, or of any of the other topics of systematics, and that is from Scripture. So we have to have a right understanding or a right theology of the Word of God as a foundation for everything else we get to, including the doctrine of God. Everything that we know about God, everything that we know about God today, is revealed to us. And apart from miraculous interventions, the, almost entirely the way it's revealed to us is through the written word. And so that's why we started last week with the theology of the word of God. This week, the doctrine of God. Next week, doctrines of creation and providence. Uh, providence is God's control of his creation. His manifest sovereignty as applied to his creation. Then, week five, we're going to talk about the doctrines of the supernatural. Okay? Um, we'll see if we can... Maybe have a seance. No, I'm kidding. Not really. But we're going to talk about miracles, prayer, angels, and demons. Someday I'm going to teach a class on the, uh, the class I taught before called The Truth About Angels and Demons, which a lot of people get that stuff wrong. I actually was at the Billy Graham Center in uh, Wheaton, Illinois one time. And they have this, it's a little sort of diorama looking kind of thing, except it's full size. And it's, it, you look out, and um, when you look up, there's a mirror. And it's supposed to sort of be a symbolic indication of heaven. Well, I was there, and there was a pastor there with a group of little kids. And this little kid leaned over and looked up, and there's a mirror on the ceiling. I'm not even sure what all that was supposed to symbolize. But the pastor said to this little girl, oh, look, it's an angel. And I thought, if you're a pastor and you don't, don't know the difference in a little girl and an angel, you have really bad theology. What are you teaching these kids? Because angels are, are completely different than people. It's not like people die and then they become angels. That's not the way it works. We'll talk about that next week. <laughs> then the doctrine of Christ. Then the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in the first hour of the last week. And the final exam. Week five, that is in two more weeks, I will have for you the paper, everything you need to know about Systematic Theology 1 for you to study and to prepare for the exam. Okay? That doesn't mean you can stop coming to class after that. Uh, just, just to be clear. Oh, one other announcement that I forgot. Thanks. At the break, I will get, we have a donations jar. Um, the people who are responsible for refilling our tea and our, our coffee and all that kind of stuff have told me that we're, we, the three classes between them are going through a lot of refreshments. That's great. We want you to enjoy it. I know that with a really boring teacher, you get to 2 o'clock and it's very hard to stay awake. So you need coffee or tea or something. But um, because it's, we're going through quite a bit of it, they have said, for anyone who cares to, you are more than free to make a donation <laughs> to help cover your refreshments. So I'll get the donation box at the break, and if you would care to drop in a quarter or, you know, peso or whatever it is you have to have in your pocket, you know, a 500, then <laughs> they're going to go to building the new church. Um, that would be great. I appreciate that. Okay, I, I, sorry, I forgot to, to mention that. Now... I want to deal with the last couple of issues related to the doctrine of the Word of God. As always, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. I ran through some of this stuff really quickly at the end of last week, and I want to spend a few more minutes about it, and then talk about the nature of the canon today. Canon, from the Greek word kanon, meaning, the, 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 the meaning of canon is the books that have been uh, agreed upon as being God's Word to us, and so they become our, our sacred documents, the Holy Scripture. The word, kanon, is a Greek word which means yardstick, literally, a measuring stick. They had a rigid stick that they would use, like we would use a yardstick or a measuring tape to make sure that things were accurate. Well, Scripture is the yardstick by which we measure our lives, and so that's why it's called a canon, from kanon, okay? So, a couple of different topics I want to mention because they're critical as we talk about the nature of Scripture, the Word of God, and our belief in it. First is inspiration. We talked about that a lot last week, but I wanted to give you kind of a definition. Inspiration is the belief, with her, as it applies to the Scripture, the Word of God, is the doctrine that the Bible is a product of God's own revelation, as the Holy Spirit spoke it to and through the prophets and apostles. In other words, Scripture says that the, the, the Word of God did not come by the will of the prophets, 
The Old Testament prophets wrote the Old Testament scripture as the Holy Spirit guided them. The New Testament apostles and those approved by the apostles, and those, that was the criteria, because we have, uh, for instance, in the Gospels, we have Matthew and John, our Gospels, uh, were apostles who wrote two of the Gospels. The other two, Mark, was John Mark, who traveled with Paul and later became the secretary and assistant to Peter. And so his version of it would have been the Gospel according to Peter, basically, and was attributed to and approved by the apostles. And then Luke, who was a companion of Paul. And when Luke wrote, wrote his document, documents, because he wrote Luke and Acts, uh, many of the apostles were still alive and were approving of it. So, prophets, Old Testament, apostles, and those approved by the apostles in the New Testament were the ones through whom God spoke in creating Scripture for us. We believe they were inspired. Scripture talks about the fact that those who wrote the Bible were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, God, the Holy Spirit, did not take away their personalities. We know that because the writing of John has a very different vocabulary and flavor and tone than does is the writing of Paul. John was not very well educated, and it's reflected in the quality of the Greek. Paul was, and it's reflected in the quality of his writing in terms of the language use. You don't see that so much in, in when you read it in English, but it's true if you study it in Greek. That doesn't mean that either one of them is not writing the Word of God. Somebody has said, well, if, since, since there are cases in the Bible where bad grammar is used, does that mean that that, was a, that that wasn't the Holy Spirit? No, the Holy Spirit, it's called plenary inspiration, where he gave the message, and the message was communicated, but it was done so in the words of, and with the personality of, the person writing it. God never takes away our personalities. Okay? He never forces himself on us such a, in such a way that we stop being ourselves. The spirit of the prophets is subject to the will of the prophets. And yet, we believe that the entire message as it was given was inspired by the Holy Spirit and is therefore God's word to us. That's the doctrine of inspiration. Right? Questions about that? Yes? Well, the only question I have deals with um, the first part being the prophets. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take Isaiah for instance. Did God, whereas the doctrine of the word of God that we're talking about, I uh, mean, the doctrine of God we're talking about today. Yes. In the book, they're talking about three, the three persons. The Trinity. The Trinity. So, was it God or is the Holy Spirit that talked about The Holy Spirit is God. Yeah, but I know, but who, I mean, in the Bible it says God spoke to mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. Right. So it's well, it also talks about the Spirit speaking. Okay. The yeah, Spirit yeah. is in the Old Testament, too. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So I, that's, that's why I wonder. The answer to that will come in our discussion of the Trinity today. Okay. Okay? And, and, and we'll start out with the recognition of the fact that this ain't easy. This is not an easy concept. The idea of three and one is not easy for us. But it is God that inspired the writing of both the Old and New Testament. That's the nature of inspiration. The particular person of the Godhead, that is, there's three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The particular person that was... The one who facilitated that through inspiration of the people who wrote it was the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is God, and Jesus is God, and the Father is God. One God. I understand. I agree. Okay. So, that's the doctrine of inspiration. Secondly, I mentioned already the canon, or from the Greek canon. The list of books that is accepted as being God's inspired works to us, and so included in the Bible. Now, how many of you have read the Da Vinci Code? <laughs> The Da Vinci Code is a fun read. It is completely wrong. No matter the fact that Dan, Dan Brown wrote in the preface to it, in the introduction to it, that this is all historical, it is not. Okay? Fiction. It's fiction. Well, the story's fiction, but he claimed that the detail, the historical details behind it are accurate. It is not. Dan Brown claims that in the early 300s, when the Emperor Constantine took over the whole Roman Empire, and he, he had become a follower of Christianity, I can't say he became a Christian because he did not join. He was not baptized until his deathbed. Okay, so he didn't join a church, the church until then. But he made Christianity the favored religion. It was not the official religion until Theodosius, quite a bit later, the emperor. But he made it the favored religion. Well, he called all these people together because there was this big dispute, this big conflict. And it is true that Constantine felt like if he could get everybody together and make Christianity the favored religion, that it would have a, a calming effect, that there would be political advantages. Dan Brown says that Constantine decided what books were going to be in the Bible, 
based upon his political agenda. That is not true. Long before Constantine, the books that we have in the New Testament, while they had not officially been given the stamp of approval, because there had never been a council of the church, everybody hadn't gotten together until the Council of Nicaea in the 320s, actually it wasn't until 381 that all of the books of the Bible, Old and, the Old Testament had already been settled, but Old and New Testament were settled in the 380s. But by the late 2nd century, like the 180s, there was a list of the New Testament books that was being distributed amongst churches that already included all of the books that we count, with the exception of Hebrews, um, and Revelation was a little that we're quite sure about. Right? Hebrews, the reason was because they weren't sure who wrote it, and that was typically an expectation that they had to know it was an apostle or somebody approved by apostle. I personally believe the reason that Hebrews had trouble and the reason it wasn't identified as a specific author is, offer, uh, author is that I think it was written by a woman. I think it was written by Priscilla, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, who worked with Paul. I don't know that for a fact, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, otherwise, there's no, good, there's no real good explanation for why that's the one book in the New Testament that we don't have any authorship attributed to it. Um, and yet, the early church, in reading that book, said, well, it's a problem that we don't know the author, but the content of this book is so consistent with everything else, we believe this is the Word of God. And so it was included, even though it, it broke the rule of not knowing who the author was. Okay? So... Uh, where was it? So, so uh, question. Yeah. So the, the canon was pretty much formed in 381? 381 was where they officially stamped it and said, this is the canon of the Word of God and no other. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The canon is closed. There are no additions to be made now. And what council was that? Uh, the council, um, council of Constantinople, I believe. 381. Okay? All right. So that's when the canon was nailed down, but Dan Brown is wrong. The church had agreed, unofficially, because there was no official gathering of the church until the 300s, but by the late 2nd century, all right, the 180s and on, and then in the 200s several times, there were almost universal acceptance of what books were going to be in there. And they had already made the decision that the Gospel of Thomas was hooey. It wasn't supposed to be in there, as well as a lot of other things. The Shepherd of Hermes was very popular for reading, and in some ways was valuable in terms of its inspiration, but everybody read it and said, no, this has got things wrong in it. Part of it's good, but part of it's really wrong, and so therefore we won't accept it as part of Scripture. And the Gospel of Thomas, the same thing. You, if you've ever read the Gospel of Thomas, it's not very long, it's the sayings of Jesus. Have we talked about this in this mm -hmm. class? Okay. The last thing in the Gospel of Thomas is, the, you know, the apostles say, send Mary away, because she's a woman, she shouldn't have any part in this. And Jesus said, don't worry about Mary, because I will turn her into a man. And after turning her into a man, she will be ready for heaven. And you go, what? <laughs> That's why the Gospel of Thomas, that and other things in the Gospel of Thomas, why it was never seriously considered as being part of Scripture, no matter what Elaine Pagel and a few other people, Pagels and a few other people have tried to say about it. Okay, so that's the canon. We're not going to get to the word, to God, Dr. God today. Infallibility. Another important word when we talk about the Word of God. Infallibility means what it sounds like, without fail or without failing. It means that script, when applied to Scripture, it means that Scripture is completely adequate in accomplishing its goal and purpose. Now that word's important, and I mentioned it last week, I'll mention it again in a minute, but let me give you the other word. Inerrancy. You've heard that one a lot if you've at all been around the issue, discussions about the Bible. Inerrancy means the belief that the Bible, as God's own words, must have been completely true and without error in any part, any part, even the science parts, in the original autographs. That's important. Inerrancy, you don't hear as much about it today, but in the 70s and 80s and 90s, inerrancy almost tore the Protestant religions apart. Because it became the mark of whether somebody was a true believer, if you would claim inerrancy. And some people had trouble with the meaning of that word. It basically means that the way it originally was set down by the writers of the Bible, that there was no, no errors in it, that any errors, and there are places like when Kings and Chronicles are talking about the same army, they have two different numbers in terms of how many people are in them. Well, people will look back now and say that was a scribal error, that a mistake was made, they dropped a digit. That's not considered a violation of inerrancy, because inerrancy is an issue of what was it originally, before any, cler any clerks made an error. Now, there is no belief in evangelicalism 
that any errors have ever been made in anything that has any theological consequence. It's not like somebody went in and rewrote the whole doctrine of who Jesus was or anything like that. These are tiny, tiny little errors. And we have, there's more um, evidence, more ancient documents and support of the Bible as we have today by a hundredfold than any other ancient document. Okay? We've got more stuff to support the fact that our Bible is accurate than any other document. More even than Shakespeare, which was like yesterday. So, the idea of inerrancy is that the Bible writers, when they originally wrote it down, there was no error in it. It was inerrant. But that some mistakes have crept in over time. As I said last week, I believe this is God's Word. You know, the question is, did they get it right the first time? I would say absolutely yes. But when people make that original autographs thing the whole point, I think that they're missing the biggest part of it. Fuller Seminary, where I did my Master of Divinity degree, um, one of the things that they maintain as one of their statements of belief is that the Word of God, the Scripture, is infallible in all matters of faith and practice. Now, if you read it in Grudo, he, he points that out as a problem. He doesn't agree with that. But to me, that, that the Scripture as we have it today, not the original autographs, as we have it today, that God the Holy Spirit has protected that so that it is completely infallible without <laughs> failing in all matters of faith and practice. God has not allowed anything to creep into that or be taken out of that that would change anything we need to know in order to have an accurate faith in Jesus Christ in order to practice our Christian faith in the world. To me, that's a more important issue, really. Because it says that the Holy Spirit continues to act up through and to today in making sure the word that we have is everything that we need for faith and practice. So, I really agree with both of those issues, and I'm, I, I look at these guys and go, what is wrong with you people that you're wanting to lynch each other over that? Okay? If we believe this is truly the Word of God for us, that's it. Yes? Well, one of the issues in talking to uh, Muslim is the fact that uh, they believe the King James Bible is more accurate than any other translations. And they're wrong. And they also say that, uh, that, that the Quran has never been changed or rewritten, so it's, it's consistent for, uh, from the beginning and the line of the road. So I'm trying to say it's a consistent, whereas ours has this version, this version, this version, this version, and, that, and it's, so it's hard to convince them of the, of the infallibility and the inerrancy right. when you talk to them. Well, um, the King James is not the best translation. People who are King James only, you know, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Um, <laughs> We know the most ancient documents we have, most of some of the most important ones, the, the Codex Sinaiticus, which was found at St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai, uh, the Codex Vaticanus, which was found down in the bowels of the Vatican, in the archives, and other documents that we have, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance, which relate to the Old Testament, which were found in the 1940s and early 50s, um, because it wasn't one find, they found multiple things. All of those things tell us that there are parts of the King James. The King James was the best they could do with what they had in 1700. Since that, or 1600, since that time, more discoveries have been made, research continues. The King James simply is not the most accurate version we have. Anybody who insists it has is not basing that upon any reason, but rather on their gut feeling. You know, I grew up with this, and it is beautiful. Okay, no question, it's beautiful, but it is not the best translation. The reason why um, Muslims would say the Quran has never been messed up with, you know, in fact, that's what you're saying is the basic doctrine of Islam, is that they say Christianity and Judaism both were religions founded by God, but then the people who were involved in it messed it up, including messed up the scripture. That's, that's why they say that Muhammad was the final prophet, because he corrected the mistakes that were made earlier. But, um, to read the Quran, you have to speak Arabic. It's never been translated into another language, technically, officially. Whenever it has been translated into English or something else, the Islamic people insist that it is not a translation, it is a commentary. It's an English commentary on because they believe they're God's own words in Arabic. It's a much more complicated issue. Bob? I've heard they've already started working on the progressive King James Version. 
which is based on the English that will be spent at 400 years from now. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Rich. How do all of the new modern <laughs> translations fit into inerrancy? Uh, in what way? All these new modern translations of the Bible? Like, I don't know how that relates to inerrancy. I mean, there are, there are some translations that are more accurate than others. Um, the, in some cases, it depends upon um, when they were written. At, like I said, the King James Version, 400 years ago. They just celebrated the 400th anniversary of King James. Um, that it is, um, they were based upon less recent, less accurate original documents. We've discovered more since then. Modern translations that are based upon the best scholarship is entirely a matter of style. Okay? Some people, when they, without regard to how accurate some of them are, if you read the New International Version, or you read the English Standard Version, fairly new, or the Holman uh, Version, which is fairly even newer, um, it's purely a matter, if, I believe all of those are accurate translations. It's purely a matter of the style. And usually when a new translation comes out today, unless they have a major new discovery, it's a matter of saying, we feel like we can do a better job of communicating that in a way that's going to be meaningful to people today, as opposed to something that was written 30 years ago, or 50 years ago, or 400 years ago. So it's a matter of style of communication, not accurate, in most cases, not accuracy. Now, there are some Bibles that are simply bad and evil and wrong. Okay, there's a book, a Bible called the Darby Bible, which was written by Unitarian, it was a really was written by Unitarians. And if you read in there, I, I, I've mentioned this to the class before, if you read John 3.16, right? You all know John 3.16. The Darby Bible says, For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. What's wrong with that? It left Jesus out. Because what do the Unitarians believe? They don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe Jesus was the Son of God. In case you didn't catch it, the way it's supposed to read is, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish. But the Darby Bible says, For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in Him will not perish. They just took it out because they don't like it or agree with it. Now that's a bad translation. Becky? Um, when you think about the message and also which translation do you prefer? Uh, <laughs> And what do you think about Justin Bieber? <laughs> uh, kidding. Um, I think the message is great. Now, I used to be wrong. Uh, Eugene Peterson was a professor at Regent, which is where I did my, master, my THM work. Um, and I thought, I was, I was wrong for a long time, I thought that the message was a paraphrase. Because it's so, you know, contemporary. It's not. Eugene Peterson is a biblical language scholar. It is a translation. He went into the Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic and translated it. But he has a real gift, and I think it's an anointed gift, to communicate it in a way that really grabs us in our contemporary. And again, what's the difference of the message and the NIV? Sorry. Eugene Peterson, it's style. Eugene Peterson is able to communicate exactly the same truths from exactly the same sources, but to do so with a style that makes you sit up and notice. And I think the message is a spectacular tool to have, and in fact Eugene Peterson has said this, that even though it's a translation, he has said, I don't recommend this be somebody's only Bible. Um, study it in something like the NIV or the ESV or the Holman, but I keep, you know, if I'm sitting at my desk right now with my computer and you know my Bible software and the whole thing, the message is right here. So whatever I'm looking at, I can grab it and say, well, what does the message say about that? Because it's a wonderful translation. The Bible that I use, and it's primarily because I believe... It's not there. <laughs> primarily because I believe that it, it, not only is it a, a very sound translation, it is the most popular translation in the world, but because, um, it, which is the NIV, I actually... The, the head of the Old Testament, Everett Harrison, was the father-in-law of a woman, that, a good friend of mine that I knew in college. Her, she and her husband were professors. Anyway, so I, I actually had a copy of the New Testament of the NIV before it was sold in, in public because they gave us some copies. But I believe that the NIV is not only an accurate translation, and they've had several translations in the last decade. I don't agree with everything. We were talking about this the other day. The NIV, the latest NIV, which is 2011, 
They translate the 23rd Psalm, instead of saying, Yea, though, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it says, Though I walk through the valley of darkness. Yeah. Kind of took the punch away. Now, the, the original language legitimately could be translated either way. Because the message is darkness in the sense is like the darkness of the death, but you don't have to translate it that way. So it's an accurate translation, but there's some things like that I don't especially care for. The main reason why I recommend the NIV and required it for our How to Study the Bible is because the NIV Study Bible has never been even approached by any other document as being the best single volume research tool. It has by far the, longest, the largest concordance, the largest dictionary, the most complete study notes for to sit down and not just read the Bible, but study the Bible. And that's two different things. Every morning, Carolyn and I, our, I get up first, go down, give the dog his treat, let him outside, and then I give him another treat when he comes back. <laughs> I make myself a cup of coffee, and I sit down, and I read the Bible. I'm not studying the Bible then, I'm just reading it. I have a, actually an ESV sitting on my side table, and I just read for the sake of consuming the Word of God. There are other times in which I sit down, and especially for me, because I do this a lot in preparation for classes and sermons and all that, where that's, that's sort of the, net, the framework for my study, and I always will have the NIV when I'm doing it. Always, 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 because I think the notes and the concordance and the, you know, everything else about it is the best you can get. And I believe it is an accurate translation. I think the, the message has really been used very well by the younger generation. Yeah. It seems like they really love it. Yeah, and I love it too. I mean, the, the prior, I mean, that, that all started with the good news. Uh, New right. Testament, which was a paraphrase. It wasn't a translation. Then later on, they did the Good News translation. The Living Bible was a paraphrase. And then they did a Living Bible translation, where with the same tone, they went back and actually went to the original documents. A, the difference is a paraphrase takes the English Bible and rewords it to make it easier to understand, whereas a translation goes back to the original Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Okay. I'm getting way too far into this. Sorry. So, for me, the issue is, yes, I believe that God's Spirit inspired the writing of all of what we know of as the Word of God. I believe, if inerrancy means the original autographs were without error, I'll buy that. But for me, the most important part is believing that <coughs> the Bible as we have it today is infallible, without fail, in all matters of faith and practice, because that addresses now. Whereas inerrancy addresses what was the Bible when they first wrote it down. Which to me is not as big a doctrinal issue. Is that fair? Yes. And I'll accept both of those, but to me the more important one is the infallibility issue. And I, it's not either or. Okay, one last part I want to address in terms of the doctrine of the Word of God, and that is the canon of Scripture is now closed. We are not going to add to it. And somebody has said, what if they rediscovered another letter of Paul? Maybe even the letter to the church of Laodicea, or the... the the first and third letters to the church in Corinth, because Paul wrote four letters to the church in Corinth, and we only have two of them. We know that because he mentions the others in his own writing. What would we do with that? Well, that will be an interesting question. Um, there's no easy answer for it, because here are some scripture verses that tell you why we believe the canon of scripture is closed. First, the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 4 says, do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. In other words, we cannot be frivolous in what we start giving credit as being God's word to us. Got, you know, it's a very, very serious thing. Now, Deuteronomy and then the next one, Proverbs, was the Old Testament. And then God added the New Testament, the story of Jesus and the understanding of what he brought to us. So there is there are those things added, but not... We better not take that lightly. Okay, it's a pretty serious deal. Proverbs 30. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Then, Revelation. I warn everyone who hears the words of prophecy of this scroll. And there's a reason, and, and Gruden talks about this, why Revelation is the last book in the Bible. You know, Not only because it sums everything up, it's the final revealing of what heaven is going to be like, but... I think this passage is important because it is the last book. 
Um, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. Ooh. And if anyone takes words away from the scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. <clears throat> That's specifically referring to the, to the book of Revelation, but I believe there is also legitimate sense in which that can be extrapolated to all of the Bible, which is why it's at the very end of the book. Okay, this is almost at the very end of Revelation. But the most important part of why we think the canon is now closed is from Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews, Priscilla, says, <laughs> in the past, past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. And by the way, Hebrews tells us that God's inspiration of the prophets was not all the same way. Some of them, he apparently actually said, write down these exact words. Some of them, like Luke, Luke did a research project. By the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he went out and interviewed people and spent time gathering all this information, and then the Spirit inspired him to write it in a way that was honoring to God, okay? But at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, from Jesus' time till now, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. Up until Jesus and the recording of the life of Jesus and what the meaning was of Jesus, God spoke through the prophets and the apostles and those approved by the apostles to give us that word, to give us the explanation. But all of God's revelation, God's self-revealing, was summed up in Jesus. And because of the fulfillment, the completion of God's revelation in Jesus, we no longer have the need for other written words. The story is complete. Now again, if we, if we find a legitimized and demonstrated and proven letter from Paul somewhere to Laodicea or Corinth or whatever, then we'll deal with that problem when we get there. But otherwise, it's not like somebody's going to come along and find some golden tablets and magic eyeglasses and say, this is a new revelation of God. That's how we get ourselves in trouble, folks. And that's why the canon is closed. It is completed in Jesus. Ron? Uh, I guess it would lend to the idea that the Jewish people would think that we have added to Yeah, absolutely. Um, but one of the things that they would say is that we've, you know, we violated the admonitions in Deuteronomy and Proverbs and elsewhere that we added to Scripture. Well, you know what? We're going to go there. We added a whole lot more than Scripture. We added the very Son of God Himself. And the Jews believe that we're not monotheists. They believe we have three gods, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Muslims claim that make the same claim. You know? Uh, so, anyway. Any questions about that? That's, I'm gonna, I've done enough with the Word of God. But it's important that we have that sense. Okay? Grudem does a great job. I don't agree with everything Grudem says, obviously, because I'm one of these infallible law matters of faith and practice that he doesn't think too well But it's because, well, I'll explain why that is. Okay. Anything else? Let's talk about God. I want to start out by talking about the doctrine of God, and Grudem talks about this, but I want to make this the center point of our first part of the discussion, and that is when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush in the wilderness of Sinai, traditionally at Mount Sinai, which is later where the law was given, and that's also where St. Catherine's Monastery is, is built, the traditional site of Mount Sinai. And if you'd like to visit St. Catherine's Monastery, I will be speaking on a, on a cruise tour in November. You can go, okay, called the Wonders of Arabia, and we will visit St. Catherine's Monastery, which not only is, again, it's the traditional site of the burning bush, the traditional site of the giving of the law, but it's also where the, the Codex Sinaiticus was found, which is probably our most important and most ancient of scripture texts. All right, very important stuff. Um, so, when God appeared in the burning bush at Mount Sinai before Moses, and he said, take your shoes, and Moses saw this bush that was burning but was not consumed, and it says he thought, I'm going to go over here and see what that's all about. And he approached it, and God said, Moses, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. And God commissions Moses to go and, and take his message to the Israelites and to lead them up out of slavery in Egypt. God says, I have heard the cry of my people in the bondage of slavery, and you, Moses, are going to go and get them out of slavery for me. And then, this is Exodus, the third chapter, 
Moses, who's a little reluctant here, you know, just like he, he was completely reluctant about everything, he didn't want to go, all right, came up with all sorts of excuses. But one of them, in verse 13, Moses says, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers, which means the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is how God is often identified in the Old Testament. If I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, well, what's his name? What shall I say to them? We are told that God then answered Moses by saying, tell the Israelites, I am who I am. Yahweh. Which, has, which, became, which is the proper name of God. The Tetragrammaton, when we transliterate it into English, it's Y-H-W-H. We add vowels in there in order to pronounce it, Yahweh. Uh, but ancient written languages did not have vowels in them. Ancient written languages only had consonants. And what they would do in Hebrew is, in order to teach children, especially boys, but children how to read the Bible, they, which is all consonants, right to left, of course, they would, in the margins or above the words in some texts, they would put dots, called vowel points, and those different dots were a code to tell them what the vowels should be, so that they would know how to pronounce it, because vowels, a, e, a, o, u, are assist, they're breathing sounds, they're assistance to us in knowing how to pronounce things. They're not necessary for written languages, and that's why they didn't exist in ancient a written languages, not just Hebrew, but any of the ancient languages, okay? So we add the vowels that were there and get Yahweh. Interesting note, some of you have heard this. Because the Jews were not allowed to say the name of God, at least they, they decided they couldn't say the name of God because it says, honor my name, you know, um, that's one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, Do not take my name in vain, is the way we usually hear it. They, would, they wouldn't want to make a mistake that they might, might be saying it in vain, so they would not pronounce the name of God. They would not say Yahweh. Instead, whenever they got to that, they would say Adonai, which means Lord. Okay. Um, whenever you see in your Bible, it's Lord with, with like small caps, L-O-R-D, but all in caps, that is Yahweh. If you see L-O-R-D not in small caps, that's, that was the original word Adonai, which means Lord. If you see Elohim, it mean, it's the generic word God. Okay. Well... Because these boys, when they're being taught to read the Bible, when they got to the name of God, Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, the four great letters, they weren't allowed to say Yahweh. They were told that whenever you get to that word, say Adonai. Well, the vowel points were from Adonai. When you take the vowels from Adonai and the consonants from Yahweh, you get Jehovah. There's no such word as Jehovah. There's nothing wrong with using it. But Jehovah is a combination of the vowels from one word, Yahweh, and the consonants, I'm sorry, the consonants from one word, Yahweh, and the vowels from another word, Adonai, put together. Okay? More fun facts from Arnold. <laughs> um, so, I am what I am, or I am that I am. It can also, because of the nature of, of the language, it could be uh, translated, I will be what I will be. There's a sense of continuance in that language. Well, what does that mean? Well, the very name of God that is presented to us, I am that I am, I am who I am, I am who I will, I will be who I will be, has three critical aspects by the very nature of that name. Because this isn't just a name like Bob or Bill. This is a, a, a name of description. This is a self-descriptive name that God has given. The first meaning for the very fact that I am that I am, there is a sense in which God is self-existent. What does that mean, self-existent? It means that God, unlike any other part of our, our knowledge or our experience, God is entirely free from being dependent upon anything else. God was not created by anything or anyone else. He was not created from anything else. He is completely contained in his existence. Now, this is very hard to wrap your head around. Because, and all of these, these first attributes I'm going to talk about that are linked to the Yahweh name, the self-descriptive name of God, they're all very hard because we have, 
almost everything else, almost anything else other than the nature of God that we want to talk about or think about, we have some sense of where it came from and what it's made of. Most of the attributes of God, and Grudem does an excellent job, in fact, I think my favorite part of this book, despite some of the complaints, uh, the most complete part of the book is his dealing with the communicable and non-communicable attributes of God. An attribute is a characteristic. <clears throat> when we talk about the love of God, we can sort of understand that, because while we don't have pure or perfect love like God, we do know what it means to love. When we talk about the power of God, even an all-powerful God, well, certainly we're not all-powerful, but we do have the ability to exercise some power. When we talk about the wisdom of God, which is a perfect wisdom, we don't know perfect wisdom, but we have kind of an idea because we know what wisdom means in human terms. But when we talk about the self-existence of God, completely non-dependent on anything else, it is very hard to wrap our heads around that because we have nothing to compare it to. In fact, you know, by, by the nature of the thing, if we had something else to compare it to, it wouldn't be self-existence. Okay, you get that? And so self-existence means God has no origins, and therefore, he is not answerable to anybody for anything. This is basically the conclusion of the book of Job. When Job is saying, hey God, I've been righteous before you, you know, what, what's going on here? I want an explanation. He doesn't. The thing about Job is he's not disrespectful, but he is confrontational in a respectful way. And what does God say? Really, Job? Were you there when I stretched the horizon? Were you there when I created the stars in the heaven and the sons of the morning sang? Were you there when I caused the sun to move in its course from one side of the heavens to the other? Really? What he's saying is, God is not answerable to anybody because of the fact that he's not dependent upon anybody. He was not created by anybody at any time. Got that? As best we can get that. This is a hard one, but it is fundamental to our understanding of the very nature of God. Again, he is, has no origins. He is not made from anything else. He was not made at any time by any other force, and therefore he is completely not answerable to anyone else for anything. Okay. Now, Matthew Henry says this, The greatest and best man in the world might say, quote, By the grace of God, I am what I am. But God says, absolutely, and it is more than any creature, man or angel, can say, I am that I am. Not what I am. That I am. He is the very definition of existence without reliance upon anything else. I see sort of a glazed look on everybody's yeah. face. <laughs> but this is important, and we can't perfectly get this, but we have to try. <laughs> because um, we naturally try to think of everything in categories, all right? And we naturally look for causes of things. Well, God is the uncaused cause. In fact, one of the arguments for the existence of God is that everything in the universe has a cause. Well, behind that cause, behind that thing is a cause, and behind that thing is a cause, the whole cause and effect, and by that is a cause, where does it end? Well, it ends with the one being that did not have a cause beforehand. Nothing else was, was responsible for God. He is self-existent. First, uh, first John and then uh, Ken. Help me, wasn't that, wasn't that Aquinas', uh, Aquinas uh, basis that he is the primary cause? Well, the first cause is one of the arguments, the, the, the yeah. rational arguments for the existence of God. Yes. You know. um, that is, that's one of the definitions. Now, um, A.W. Tozer, do you all know A.W. Tozer? Uh, yes. Yeah. Really good guy. I mean, even, even, you know, his writing is a little hard for us sometimes because he's a 19th century writer, but really good. Um, Tozer says that one of the reasons that philosophers and scientists have so much trouble with the idea, very idea of God is because those, those disciplines, science and philosophy, both are dedicated to the task. Their whole job is trying to account for the things that we know about the things in the world. And especially accounting for where they fit in the rest of the things, what they're made out of, where they came from, etc. Philosophy and science, right? <coughs> well, the problem that they have with God is, if we believe in the self-existence, God, he's not made out of anything else, and he didn't come from anywhere that we can understand or define. 
And so science and philosophy are perpetually trying to create a kind of God that fits within their system. They will talk about God, for instance, as natural law, okay, or the evolutionary force, or something else that they can sort of fit in their categories. Because the nature of a self-existence God, system God, simply does not fit anywhere in human philosophy, I mean, not comfortably, in human philosophy or in science, all right? Um, and that's why we have so much trouble with that. God's self-existence means, as I said, he's not, he's not liable to anybody else. God is not answerable to us or anyone else. Back to the Job story. God cannot be challenged because he is completely self-existent without the need to explain himself. All right? We have no questions that can reach a self-existent God in that way. Now, we do ask questions, and God in his grace to us often answers our questions. But he doesn't have to. And he certainly doesn't have to answer questions about, you know, who are you, God? Or what do you think you're doing, God? He's not required to answer anything. Okay? He is not answerable to us in that regard. So that's one. God is self-existent and is not required to answer for or fit in uh, anything or fit in any categories we might have. The second thing that is inherent in the whole Yahweh, I am that I am, is that God is self-sufficient. That means God doesn't need anything, right? Um, Self-sufficiency has a sense in which, while it's an abstract term, we can understand it, that God doesn't need anything, and therefore God is not dependent upon anything or anyone. God does not need us. This is a very common and popular heresy, and a lot of people have it. Probably one out of five of you have it. The idea that God made us, for instance, because he needed us to worship him. God did not need us to worship him. God does not need us to love him. God allows us to worship him. God allows us to love him. But God did not need that. God does not need anything. Um, in the old days, this was called the doctrine of immutability. And that is that, that God doesn't change and does not have any needs. I'll, I'll get to immutability when I get to the third point but the idea is God doesn't need worshipers. God doesn't need people to love him. God needs nothing. He has, out of his purely out of his own will, he has created a world of beauty. Because he needed to. God did not need to create. This was just his will, his desire. Um, the, a lot of people seem to have this idea that God was somehow lonely. And so he needed to create the world and create us so that he would have companions. God desired to have companions. God desires to be in a relationship with us, but not because he had any need or any lack. He is completely self-sufficient in that regard. Um, Arthur W. Pink says, God was under no constraint, no obligation, no necessity to create. That he chose to do so was purely a sovereign act on his part, caused by nothing outside himself, determined, by nothing but his own good pleasure. For, Ephesians 1.11 says, he worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Because he wanted to. Why does God do the things he does? Because he wants to. Sorry, Ken, did you have a question or comment? Okay, if God is self-existent, the very essence of him being self-existent, then, then it would eliminate any other self-existent uh, being in simply because two self-existent beings could not exist. Yeah, there is no other self-existent being. I just, want, I, just, I just want to make sure my logic wasn't flawed no, in that. No, absolutely. God is the only self-existent being. Everything else was made by Him. Because if there were two self-existent beings, they would not be self-existent. They'd be co-existent and therefore not be self-existent. Right. Okay. Okay, good. Um, again, A.W. Tozer, I'll quote him again, and this is with regard to the self-sufficiency and whether God needs us, whether God needs worshipers or needs us to love him or was lonely or whatever. Tozer says, we are all human, uh, I'm sorry, were all human beings suddenly to become blind, still the sun would shine by day and the stars by night, for these owe nothing to the millions who benefit from their light. Got that? So, were every man on earth to become atheist, it would not affect God in any way. He is what he is in himself without regard to any other. 
To believe in him adds nothing to his perfections. To doubt him takes nothing away. God does not need us. He chose us. He created us and then called us to himself. And we need to take that as a great blessing and even an honor. If God needed us, it wouldn't be nearly as great a blessing that God chooses to be in relationship with us. Well, um, need communicates a defect. Mm -hmm. A deficiency. A deficiency. Perhaps not a defect, but a deficiency. A deficiency. Yeah. So, and, and God and has that's not consistent with God. Right. Okay. Now, that does not mean that God, what God doesn't need us. It doesn't mean that God doesn't give us responsibilities. You know, he created Adam and Eve and said, take care of the garden, you know, subdue the earth, rule over the animals. He gives us jobs. You know, you guys are going to be my gardeners. But that's not because he needed them to do that. And we have to be clear about that. Uh, we'll go first and then, and then uh, Frank. Uh, well, God is love. I uh, mm -hmm. had an aunt that gave me a little plaque when I was a teenager. said God is love. Right. And the meaning of that has changed over my lifetime many times. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, he's, if he is love, why would he need our love? Right? He is self-existent enough. And in fact, we'll talk about the Trinity in the second half. <laughs> and one of the aspects of the Trinity, that God is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is that the, the three persons of the Trinity, of the one God, are in relationship with one another. There is in that relationship love between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, I have to add respect and, and honor and glory and, and all the rest. But oh, yeah, there's a lot of other heavy caveat. Yeah. Frank? Well, from, from a human aspect, I understand what you're saying, and certainly God is self sufficient. But the, the other level that you alluded to, which is in the book down the road, what about the angels? In other words, what, what, what is that in relation to God? In other words, he doesn't need the mankind. If we're all atheists, he doesn't care. Mm -hmm. but, but where does the where do the angels fit in in this particular self sufficiency? Okay, we'll talk about angels in more detail under the supernatural. But in the same way, God did not need the angels either to serve him, to be his messengers, or to sing his praises. I mean, the angels are presented as those who sing glory, glory, glory. You know, and they sing in his presence. God may take pleasure in that, but he doesn't need it. That's the difference. Being self-sufficient means he doesn't require that. He doesn't need it. Doesn't mean he doesn't take pleasure in it. Okay? Um, so, and that's the difference. That's true with angels in the same way it is with humanity. He does not need us. Some people believe that God needs us to be his defenders. Or his evangelists. You know? That as though God is sitting on his throne, wringing his hand, or, or his donors. That God is sitting on his throne, wringing his hands, saying, Oh, I sure hope those people down at Lakeside Presbyterian Church get on the stick this week, or my will is not going to be done in the universe. No. God does not need us. He doesn't need our money, although... I'll get to that in a second. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our, us defending him. He doesn't need us evangelizing for him. He allows us to do those things. Why? Because it's a blessing for us to participate with God. He does it for our sake. God does not need your money. He wants you to give your money because that will help you. And if you don't, then you are not going to have a right relationship with God because you've got a wrong relationship with something else that's controlling your life, and that is your money. But God doesn't need those things. God doesn't need anything. Okay? And once we realize that, we realize why it is that God is the one we ought to trust. In fact, He's the only one we can trust. Again, I'm quoting Tozier. Among all created beings, no one dare trust in itself, other than God, of course. God alone trusts in himself. All other beings must trust in him. Since he's the one that's completely self-sufficient, he's the one that's, I'm going to talk about the eternal unchanging in a second. Um, unbelief, Tozier says, is actually a perverted kind of faith. For unbelief puts its trust not in the living God, but in dying men. If we don't trust in God, that means we trust in something else. And since God is the only one who's self-sufficient, if we trust in something else, we are trusting in something that is inherently untrustworthy because it may fail us. Because it is not powerful enough to stand on its own. Only God is self-sufficient in the way that He truly is trustworthy. Okay? Now, the third point. I'm going to do this and then we'll take a break. God is eternal. Again, all three of these 
aspects are inherent in the descriptive name that God told Moses, Yahweh. I am that I am. I am self-existent. I am self-sufficient. I am eternal. Okay, what does it mean that God is eternal? It means he is everlasting. It doesn't mean he started at some point and he won't stop. It means no beginning and no end. That God is an eternal being. In fact, he is outside time itself. That's a hard one for us to understand. And let me give you an analogy. I think that, that helps us. Picture a model train that is stretched out long distance. We are sitting on that train. And so as we ride along, we see the things that come by one at a time. That's an analogy of time. You know, just one darn thing after another. The experiences that we have in sequence, they don't, you know, time is nature's way of keeping all things from happening at the same time. We experience these things one at a time. But imagine, if it's a model train, that I'm standing above it. And I can reach out and I can touch the cars that are there, or here, or there, or over here. Any one of them at the same time, equally. That's the way God is with time. He is outside time. God can touch the ancient past, the recent past, the present, the, from our perspective, the near future or the distant future, all at the same time. Because time is like that model rail car, but God is standing above it and can reach out and touch any part of it anytime he wants. He is outside time. So the definition of eternal means time does not affect him. No beginning, no end, present at all moments in time at once. All right? Now, Abraham said of Jehovah God, He is the everlasting God. Moses said, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth, or, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The book of Revelation describes God as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, etc., etc., etc. The idea of an everlasting God, an eternal God, is repeated over and over and over through Scripture. Now, there's two major consequences to the fact that God is eternal. One, it means God can be trusted. Again, it relates back to what we were talking about under self-sufficient. If God is eternal, one part of that is unchangeability. God is the same for all eternity. No beginning, no end, never changing. Again, the doctrine for that typically is called immutability, unchangeability in other words. And if we know that God does not change ever, that means that God is not going to change his mind and decide not to love us anymore. God is not going to change his attitude toward us or our acceptance of his son. Nothing about him is going to change. It also, by the way, means, contrary to popular opinion, that the things God describes as sin in His Word are still sin. He doesn't change in that regard either. Even though society, I quoted before that G.K. Chesterton says, people don't usually disagree on what is wrong, but they often disagree on what wrongs are acceptable. Well, just because modern times are making some things God has called sin, we're trying to get everybody to agree that they're now acceptable, God has not changed. His opinion about things have not changed. And they never will change. We have paid places in Scripture, and I think that, that um, Grudem does a good job of this, where it talks about God seeming to change his mind or even repent. Well, there are other Scriptures that say God does not repent as a man repents. And Grudem, I think, does a good job of explaining that when God makes a statement like that, he's saying, given the current circumstance, you keep going the way you are, this is what I'm going to do. But God gives us the op option of doing something differently. For instance, the, the passage in 1 Kings, where, um, I'm sorry, in the 2 Samuel, where David goes to the city of Kiriath, and he's there, and he seeks the Lord, and, and he says to the Lord, Lord, will Saul attack us here? And the Lord says, yes, he will, to David. And then David says, and if he attacks, will the people of Kiriath turn me over to him? And God said, yes, they will. Well, David got on his mule and took off, all he and all his men. So he wasn't there when Saul arrived. In fact, Saul heard that he had left Kiriath, so he didn't go there. And you say, well, was God wrong? No. God was saying, if you stay here, this is what's going to happen. If you don't stay here, that's not going to happen. That doesn't mean God changed his mind about that. It means 
people made decisions that changed the circumstance. And so God no longer you know, followed through on that, or that was no longer. It doesn't mean God changed. It meant God gives us some freedom to decide, am I going to take the left fork or the right fork? And God's will. God knows everything. He sees all of that. What he says to us in Scripture, or even like he did with David that he speaks to him, will change if we change the situation. That doesn't mean God changed his mind or didn't know what he was talking about. Okay? Grudem does a better job of explaining that. Okay. Um, so the first aspect of the eternal nature of God is that God is unchanging. He will not change his love for us, his promises to us. That's why the promise of God to the people of Israel has not been revoked. Paul makes it very clear in Romans that God's promise to the Israelites is still there. We are adopted into that family. Okay, so that's the first thing. And a second major consequence of God's uh, being eternal is he is inescapable. God is the only being that we can ever say, well, maybe he'll change his mind, or maybe he'll move away, or maybe he'll die, and then I don't have to deal with him. God will not change, he will not move away, he will not die. Whether we deal with him in this life, or we deal with him in the life to come, God is eternal, he will be there, he will, he's immutable, he's not going to change. You've got a choice. Are you going to deal with him now or deal with him later? Now you have a choice. Okay? That's part of the nature of the eternal aspect of God. Any questions about that part? Can I John? Uh, make a you know, trying to describe God is like a man trying to describe the Empire State Building and all the Worse. diagrams and everything. It's, just, it's incredible. But about five years ago, I don't know how this happened, but I, I was introduced to a book. I still haven't finished it. But I, I have... Is it Gerka But it's... The, you know, people have attempted, like Tozier and Pink, and they've done a good job. But I would say that the prints... Of, of, of men who have communicated this this incomprehensible God that we have it was a guy named Stephen Charnock and he wrote this book called The Existence and Attributes of God he wrote it in 1765 it was a real thick book and if this is hard that would be hard for you it's not it's not Field of Screen magazine you know it's not Armchair reading. Well, as 20th, we learned our language in 20th century. It's hard for us even to read 19th century. And the further back we go, the harder guy, it is. But this guy, I mean, he is. Uh, it's it's just, you know, painters use different strokes and different colors. He really, if, if anybody was interested in pursuing these attributes of, of this incomprehensible guy, that book is worth okay. the Charnock. Sure Existence and Attributes of God by Stephen Charnock. Okay, good. We're going to take a break. I want to do two more quick points, and then we want to get on to the Trinity. <laughs> um, one of the ramifications, or two of the ramifications, of what it means that God is the one who can say, the only one who can say, I am that I am, that God is self-sufficient, or self-existent, self-sufficient, and eternal, is that we are to have no other God. There is none like Him. There is none other that we should wor worship. After Moses saw God in the burning bush, or heard from God, the theophany at the burning bush in Sinai, he goes into Egypt, the whole plagues and Pharaoh thing, they cross the Red Sea, and they come back to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai is where the law was given. And the start of the law that was given to Moses said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, etc. Because of the nature of God, the Yahweh, self-existing, self-sufficient, and eternal, only He is to be worshipped. No other gods, because there truly are no other gods. There are other spiritual beings who want to trick you into thinking they're gods. The demons. But there is no other being that qualifies truly for being God. And in terms of our worship of Him, we are told not to create an image, even an image of God, and worship that, 
nor any image of anything else. Why? Why is there especially a problem with making an image of God? For the very fact that he is so far beyond our ability to truly conceive of him. We cannot, don't be frustrated or beat yourself up if you're sitting there thinking, I really can't get my head around self-existent, you know, self-sufficient, eternal. It's not within our ability to even conceive of it, much less to, to in some way uh, replicate it. Whenever we try to have an image to represent God, two things happen. One, it obscures His glory. Because we are taking the things of the God who is I am that I am and trying to create it in a form that we can conceive of. Put it in, make it out of materials. In some way, even think that it represents God. It obscures the true glory, the true nature of God. As hard as it is, as much as we struggle with conceiving that, we can't try to make it less than it is. And the second thing is, it misleads people who worship Him. Inevitably, if we start worshiping an image, even if we're telling ourselves that it is an image that we intend to represent God, before long we're not worshiping God anymore. We're worshiping that image. Because our human frailty forces us, out of habit, to begin to think of that as our God. Okay? And so, the very nature of God as being the Yahweh God, the God who only and alone can say, I am that I am, then we cannot perceive of any other being to be worshipped, nor can we create an image of God that we would use for worship. Now, yes? There's pictures of Jesus in various publications. The Catholic Outside. Church has uh, thousands of statues. So are they doing something wrong or what? Not inherently wrong. Um, the Eastern Orthodox faith especially has a long tradition of using icons, even though the church, I mean, they, they've had wars over this. And they perceive an icon as being something that focuses our attention on God. They, they are an object through which we are to focus on the nature and attributes and glory of God, not themselves to be worshipped. The problem you get into, the danger, and I believe because Eastern Orthodoxy, the mindset of those who are in the East is very different than ours. That's why they never had a problem with the theological controversies we've had in the West. Because they think differently about it. They are by nature more meditative. They are by nature more spiritual. You know, not as oriented toward making everything rational. Nothing wrong with rationality, but when that's the whole point, then you get in trouble. So they have not had the same difficulties with the use of icons. Quite frequently in the West, that is the Catholic Church, we do run into problems. I have no difficulty with the representations of Jesus on the other side of this wall, because you'll notice they're at the back of the sanctuary. You know, we do not put them up front as though they become the, art, the item or article or focus of worship. Unfortunately, for many people, and this is especially true in developing countries where Catholicism is dominant, there ends up being too much of a focus on those images. I remember when and again, I'm trying not to be critical of the Catholic Church, but we have to recognize differences here. When the Virgin of Zapopan was brought down to the lake, you know, Our Lady of the Lake, they bring her down here every year, they made a big point in the articles about that, of saying that even though the old one, which is like 400 years old, I think, it was beginning to fall apart, and they didn't think they could travel with it anymore because it was too fragile, that they had a new one commissioned by approval of the Vatican, and then they brought that new one and they had it touch the old one so that it would absorb the power. Yes. What are we saying when we say that? That the power is in that statue? That's a problem. And people who believe if I can, you know, if I can just touch that statue, I will be healed. For many people, that does become the object of their worship because they perceive that there, in that thing, is the, the power and the nature and even the salvation of God. And that is not scriptural. That is not what we believe. Okay? Um, so, it can be a real problem. It doesn't have to be. That doesn't mean that there is something inherently wrong with having an image of Jesus. If we do it, you know, in this case, it is... Artistic. It is representing, you know, uh, the history of our belief about the one who is our savior. It is not a thing we worship. I would not allow those to be on the front wall where people are looking at them during time of prayer, for instance. All right. Um. So, I, I'm not sure if I understand this correctly, but uh, Eastern, 
Eastern Orthodoxy is not Catholic in any way? No. So it's the Roman Catholics or the Western? Correct. Aspect. In 1054, there's a split between the Roman Catholicism, which was a Latin-speaking church with its center in the Bishop of Rome, and the Eastern churches, which were Greek-speaking and had their own rights, and, and, and they looked to the Patriarch of Constantinople. Originally in the history of the church, there were five great patriarchies or centers. Those were, by tradition, Jerusalem, although that was a never, never a major church after the early church. Um, they were Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. Well, Antioch in Syria, not so much anymore. I mean, it was conquered by the Muslims. Alexandria in Egypt, conquered by the Muslims. Uh, Jerusalem split up between different religions, and again, it was never—it was more a, a, an honorary thing because they didn't weren't really a center of power. That left two: Constantinople, that they called Istanbul, and Rome. The heads of the two churches, the Bishop of Rome and the Patriarch of Constantinople, were, for hundreds of years, were fighting over who's really in charge here. Rome was the old capital of the Roman Empire, and they claimed the authority because Paul and Peter had been there, and because that had been the old capital of Rome, the center of the Roman world. But Con Constantine moved the center of the Roman Empire to, to Byzant Byzantium and renamed it Constantinople. He actually called it New Rome, and everybody else started calling it Constantinople. And that became the center of the Roman Empire. And so they had a claim on it because they said, you guys are old hat. We're the new Rome. Those two argued a lot of it was political. A lot of it had nothing to do with spirituality. Eventually, in the 11th century, you know, because of the threat of the Muslim armies, um, Constantinople said, if you'll come to our aid, Western Europe, then we'll actually agree to be under the authority of the Pope. And then a bunch of other things happened, and the Pope sent representatives, and the, the, the representatives he sent were kind of nasty fellows, and they said, bow down right now before us as, as, as representatives of the Pope, and they went, no, I don't think so. So he excommunicated them in the name of the Pope. And then the next day, the Patriarch of Constantinople excommunicated the Pope. <laughs> and then they had a big fight over a change that had been made in the Nicene Creed. Now, the Nicene Creed came from the Council of Nicaea, which is a you know, spitting distance from Constantinople. It was an Eastern creed. It had been taken over by the West, and at, in Toledo, which is in Spain, they added something to it. The old way that the Nicene Creed read said, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. Well, they decided in Toledo, in Spain, that you can't get much more Western Europe than that, that they were going to make it read, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. That little phrase, and the son, is called the filioque. Well, they started that in Toledo, and then everybody in the West started using it, and then when some monks went to Constantinople, and they said, you know, and they recited the Nicene Creed, the people there who had been, you know, they, the Nicene Creed had been theirs, they went, what was that? <laughs> and they had this huge fight over the expression, and the son. Does the Holy Spirit proceed just from the Father, or does he proceed from the Father and the Son? The filioque, that was the last straw. That's what led to everybody excommunicating everybody else. And uh, 10, 1054, 1056, 1056 I think it is, um, officially split off the Eastern churches with the Greek rite, went their way, the Western churches, and under the Patriarch of Constantinople, the Western churches, under the Bishop of Rome. Catholicism, Orthodoxy. Okay, and then Orthodoxy split into several things. There's uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy, etc. Roman Catholicism obviously split into Protestantism and, and Catholicism, so there you go. That's the history class. Why am I in German question? <laughs> uh, okay. Let's talk about the Trinity. Um, and if you want those history classes, there, there are, you know, two history classes that are videotaped. One leading up to the Reformation, one after the Reformation. God as Trinity. I do believe that Grudem does a good job with this. The three points that he makes are the, the three truths with regard to our belief about the Trinity. One, God exists as three persons. Calvin didn't like the word persons. He preferred the word subsistence, but subsistence doesn't mean much to us nowadays. If a person means a unique personality with a will and everything else, then person is fine. 
as long as we understand that it doesn't mean a separate entity. So, one, God exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Second, each person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is fully God. Third, there is one God. Now, how the heck does that work? Okay, let's talk about that. First, we need to acknowledge, as Bruton talks about, tr the word trinity, which is a, from a Latin word trinitas, which means threeness. Okay. Uh, the tr word trinity does not appear anywhere in the Bible. And yet, there are a lot of evidences in Scripture that lead us to this as a doctrine. In fact, this is perhaps the fundamental doctrine about our understanding of the nature of God. Without an understanding of the Trinity, it all falls apart. At various times in history, people have usually tried to deny one, the great heresies are all efforts to try to deny one or more of these principles. Okay? The Arian heresy that led to the Council of Nicaea, the first great council of the church, Arian, Arius claimed, he was a presbyter from Alexandria, an elder from Alexandria, he claimed that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were not all fully God. He was willing to use the word divine, but he, the definition he had for what, how the Father was divine was different than how the Son was divine. And the premise back in those days, um, Arius said that with regard to, Jesus, to the Son of God, there was a time when he was not. Okay, that was his statement. Meaning, he believed the Son of God was created, the first of all creation, by God the Father. So, the Son of God is not fully divine in the sense that he is not co-eternal with the Father. That was one of the first great heresies that almost split the church. That's what led Constantine to call the Council of Nicaea. Is the heresy over the issue of the Trinity. The Nicene Creed, the first great creed of the church, was written to address that issue. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Then... We believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, begotten of the Father, begotten, not made. Take that, Arius. <laughs> not made. Of one being with the Father. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Son, Father and the Son, He is worshipped and glorified. Okay? Those, the Nicene Creed and other creeds that came along were intended to clarify the doctrine of the Trinity. That is the fundamental doctrine of our knowledge of God, which means it's the fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. If we get the Trinity wrong, nothing else works, even though it's very hard for us to understand. Now, um, this is the, is the historic symbol that has been used for the Trinity. And hopefully you can figure it out. What it says is that God... God the the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. But the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. They are one God with three persons. Manifestations, subsistences, however you want to work. Now, there are a lot of different ways that we have tried over the years to come up with analogies. Oh, and by the way, I should say, this symbol, if you've ever seen that in churches, that's, a, that's the, the symbol for the Trinity. Sometimes it's like this, kind of cool, like it's, it's uh, the, some of the Celtic knots were designed as symbols of the Trinity. If you, that looks familiar like a Celtic knot. This is another version of it, which is the same symbol, you see it goes here, but with a circle around it to indicate unity. All right? Those are historic symbols for the Trinity. And as you can see, they're versions of this. Okay, It's a similar kind of thing. Um, so we have a history of trying to explain symbolically and verbally what the Trinity means. Yes, Terry. Um, say something more about the is not part. Okay. Because they are. I mean, they are. Okay, they're but... They're manifestations, but what is... They're all the God, but the they nature, are just... The nature of each is similar. Okay, but they are... They're, they're, connected. they're connected. The nature of each is equal. All right? Yeah. Um, and I'll talk about that. I mean, it, it, I, we'll give you a couple of big words. Just We're talking about the, equa ontological equality, but economic uh, subordination. 
is the term, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. I'll actually put the words up there for you, okay? okay. Um, the, um, as I said, we've, we've struggled down through the last 2,000 years to come up with a good way to explain that, and we're always coming up with analogies. Some of the analogies simply are wrong. Some people have heard, um, well, it's like ice, water, and steam are all three the same basic substance, but they exist in three different states. The problem is it can't be ice, water, and steam at the same time. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three exist at once. One of the better ones, although still all analogies fall apart, one of the better ones, I think, is an egg. Because we think of an egg, one egg. But inherent in that, there, there's a shell, and a yolk, and a white. All of which have different purposes, but all of which make up one egg. That's one of the better ones. It's said that um, St. Patrick converted the heathens of Ireland to belief in Christianity by using the symbol of the shamrock, which is one clover, but it's got three distinct lobes. And he used that as an analogy for the Trinity and explained, therefore, how it is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's why the clover leaf is a symbol of today of Ireland. Okay, um, And yet that falls short because it's not exactly one thing. I mean, it's, you know, I struggled for a long, long time to come up with my own analogy for how this works. And the one I have come up with, after years of breaking my you know, brain over this, is me. <laughs> um, a human being, a person. I am one person. Within me, which is, makes up me, I have a mind, which is the controlling part of me. It's the one that makes the decision of where I will go and what I will do. I have a spirit, which is the part of me that responds to things that are not cognitive. Love is not a rational cognitive thing. Honor, loyalty, commitment, my emotions, they're not cognitive. There's some part of me that responds completely differently to a whole different set of criteria, right? And my body. All three of those are me. And all three of them have different responsibilities within, the, within being me. Now, it's still not a perfect analogy, but it's the best one I'm able to come up with for explaining how it is that there is one God, I don't literally mean that one God, but there is one being we call God who has three distinct aspects, all of which were, are necessary for that one being to exist. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's the best I've been able to come up with, and it may, I think it's, it's better than a, some of them, like the, the ice water scene just doesn't work. I mean, some of them are wrong. Uh, because they, they, and in fact, some of them reflect that analogy, that, that ice water steam reflects a heresy called Sabellianism, Sabellius was the guy who came up with it, or sometimes called modalism, which suggests that God is one God, but he has appeared at different times in different forms. Mm -hmm. You know, that he has been the Father sometimes, and then he became the Son, and then after Jesus was resurrected, he came back as a spirit, but it's one God. No, all three of the persons of, the, of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all exist simultaneously and equally in history, in eternity, rather. Um, and so that doesn't work. And modalism is actually you know, one of the ancient heresies about this. Um, now, uh, I actually had a guy one time from our church who'd been going to my classes, and he said he wanted to get a cup of coffee because he had something really important to tell me. And I said, okay, great. So we got together for coffee, and he said, you know, from your Bible study, I've been thinking about this, and I was reading in, in about the baptism of Jesus and how Jesus is there, and he goes into the water, and then the Holy Spirit comes down on him, and the voice from heaven says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And he said, I figured it out. Jesus was just a human being up until the time that God the Father sent the Holy Spirit, and then he became divine. I figured it out. And I went, actually, you didn't tell. <laughs> because that's another heresy called adoptionism, which says that God the Father took a human being, Jesus, and adopted him as his son at the moment of baptism. But the problem is that denies the co-eternal existence of Jesus as the Son of God, from all time with God in heaven. So there are a lot of different heresies. As I said, almost all of the major heresies that have afflicted the Christian church over the last 2,000 years have been some uh, heresy, some variant that is wrong about the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay. Now, again, Grudem does a good job of presenting a lot of different um, 
explanations for the Trinity, and a lot of the verses. He does a lot more than this, but two of the ones that are really important. Genesis 1.26. Then God said, let us make man in our image. These are plural words. And God is not talking to the angels because human, humanity is not made in the image of the angels. We are made in the image of God. Which is why we share a lot of attributes with God. I'll talk about that in a minute. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let him rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. The Trinity is not just an invention in the New Testament. It is present throughout the Old Testament. In fact, it is present from the first chapter of Genesis, even before this part of the first chapter of Genesis. When it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And God said... Let there be light. God spoke the word. And then it says, and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. We learn later on in John, in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, who says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay? He was with God, a distinct person, but he was God. Distinct persons, but still one. The same was in the beginning with God. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. That is the word. When God the Father spoke the word and God said, that word, it was through the power of that spoken word that things were created. The word is Jesus. Because John 1 then goes on to say, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have perceived his glory. He's talking about Jesus, because it's the start of the story of Jesus. God the Father spoke through the Word, who is the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, and the Spirit of God was present hovering over the waters. The Trinity is present in the first, very first verses of Genesis. And then we have the plural references. Elsewhere, Grudem brings this up, you know, and, and God said, um, Whom shall we send, and who will go for us? God, in his three persons, that is one, there is a community that is inherent in existence in God. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in relationship with one another, in love, they are sharing and in community, and yet they are one being. And if you don't get that, that's okay, because this is hard. And yet we can't waffle on this, we can't compromise this, because if we do... It takes us in all kinds of wrong directions. Usually, it's some version of saying that the Son is not fully divine. Well, you know what? If Jesus is not fully divine, if the second person of the Trinity is not the co-eternal God, you know, one of the persons of the Trin of the Godhead. When we say Godhead, Godhead is the, is the word that refers to all three of the persons in one God, the Godhead. Okay? If we don't believe that Jesus is fully God, co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit, then everything falls apart in terms of our salvation. If He is not co-eternal with the Father, then He is insufficient to save us. Because He's not self-existent, self-sufficient, and eternal, unless He is equal with God the Father. Okay? And usually the direction that goes, by the inspiration of Satan, is to try to diminish the authority and the eternal existence of the second person of the Son. John? Kuda makes a real important point here, and you're dealing with concepts that are hard to grasp. You've mentioned oh, yes. that several times, and we're all just like this. But he says, um, and, and I think it was Augustine that said the same thing, I believe so that I might understand. Right. You begin with a belief. You believe, you, yep. you, you believe this. I don't hear, I don't grasp it, I don't understand it, but I believe this, and I've chosen to believe this. He used the phrase, I think Kuda uses the phrase, phrase, faith-seeking understanding. Right. And so our understanding comes on the skirts of what is already a conviction in our lives. If, right. we, if we've got that reversed, we'll never grab this. Yeah, we'll exactly. I mean, we, we step forward in faith. Someone has said that we take a step in faith, and then we realize that it was only because of God's inspiration we were able to take that step in the first place, that it was God who caused that first step. And you're right. Augustine and then Anselmo Canterbury both said, I believe that I might understand. Aquinas, as great as he is, said, I understand that I might believe. Because he was very much more a rationalist. In fact, uh, another class we'll do sometime that I taught is called What's Wrong with the World? In which I started with, you know, with uh, Platonic thought, you know, and, and, uh, and Aristotelian thought. 
and draw a line of how those are the two major ways of thinking about things. Augustine was the product of, of Platonism, and, uh, and Aquinas was the product of Aristotelianism, which is much more rationalistic in this approach, and that feeds all the way out to today. Okay? We'll get into that in philosophical theology. Um, yes, Ken? Can I throw one more illustration and you can see if you pick it apart? Okay. I just go to this one. If God is love, can love truly exist by itself? Mm -hmm. Or does it, I mean, it can, but can it? Or is it much easier for it to exist within three persons and therefore fully expressing himself within the three person of the Trinity makes him therefore more... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, God is, love cannot exist without an object. Now, it's possible to have self-love, <laughs> in which case you're the object of your own self, of your own love, which is called narcissism. But, uh, yes, if God is love, God is inherently, love is one of the characteristics of God. It exists because God is inherent in himself a community. He is three persons, that is, one being, one God. Um, now, so how do those three relate to each other? They are all co-eternal. They are all co-equal in their power and authority. It's not that the Father is stronger or that the Holy Spirit, just because he doesn't have a name, doesn't really have a personality or whatever. Okay. Um, these three principles, God exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each person is fully God. There is one God. And by the way, this is the biggest problem that Jews and, is, and Muslims have with us. Both Jews and Muslims say you worship three gods, but we don't. And again, Gruden does a good job. All of the different verses that explain there is one God, and yet he is described as being three entities within one, three persons within one. Now, so what's the relationship? Okay, for it. Just a quick question. Then. In the Old Testament, there was the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There was. Then how can the Jews say that we, we worship three gods? Well, because they don't perceive it that way. <laughs> um, they, they believe that the Spirit of God is simply another way of saying God. And they don't, because it doesn't say the Son of God, the second verse of the Trinity. It's not that specific. Now, again, you look at it, there's a lot of references, and it seems very clear. The doctrine of the Trinity, while Trinity is never mentioned by name, there are all kinds of verses that there's all, the only way to interpret them, now, and we interpret the Old Testament based upon the knowledge we gain in Jesus and in the New Testament. Okay? For instance, a lot of the passages in the Old Testament, which seem very clear to us now that we have the Gospel of John talking about the Word was with God and the Word was God, would have been much harder to see and understand if you didn't accept the New Testament. Well, you know, we have better hindsight because... You know, John and other writings have given us, you know, uh, glasses with which to focus more accurately on some of the Old Testament. They would say the Spirit of God simply means God's presence, and when they and it never talks about the Son of God per se, but it does talk about the Word, which we then, um, which logos, which the Jews talked a lot about, especially Jewish philosophers like Philo of Alexandria, Jewish philosopher, who talked a lot about the logos, the Word, um, and yet. We see it very clearly, but if they don't accept the, the, the basic principle, it's like if you don't accept it in faith, then you're not going to understand it. You can't suss it out logically and then decide you believe it. We take a step of faith. I believe that I might understand. Once you believe, I think it makes perfect sense. But if you start out with an attitude of disbelief, it's probably not going to click for you. Okay? And so that's why Jews and Muslims believe that we worship three gods. Because they cannot conceive of this. And this is, you know, it's scripturally accurate. Um, Paul says that what we believe is a kind of foolishness yeah. to those who are not of faith in Jesus Christ. They're not going to see it. They are blinded to the truth of this. Only when we step forward in faith. And, and in fact, this, especially the aspect of the Trinity that is the nature of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who saves us, is a very, because it's so difficult to understand. G.K. Chesterton said, you know, the world wants clarity in everything. They want everything to be explicable. They want everything to be understood. And in trying to make everything understood, nothing is clear. <laughs> Chesterton said, if you will allow one thing to be unclear, everything else comes into focus. That's right. 
Which means if we will accept the miracle, the very difficult to understand aspect of the Trinity, which has wrapped up in it the reality of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity who has lived for eternity and who then chose to limit himself as a human being to come and live and die and be resurrected for us, if we will accept that one mystery, everything else makes sense. Everything else comes into focus. But if we're not willing to take that step to accept that mystery, then nothing is going to be clear. Not the human condition, or what we're supposed to do with it, or anything else. Okay? Chesterton was exactly right. And inherent in his, in his statement is the fact that this is hard to understand. This is a mystery. It is going to be, we're never going to be able to fully contain this in our little brains. Okay? No matter how hard we try. All right, now, so what is the relationship of these three persons? Why are there three persons in the Trinity that is one God? Well, it's because each one of the three persons of the Trinity have a different job description. <laughs> my, own, my own way of putting it. Within the Trinity, all of them are equal. They are equal in power. They are equal in authority. There is no sense in which the Son is less than the Father or the Spirit is less than the Son or the Father. They are all equal. And yet, they choose, or they have, as, as part of their nature, different responsibilities. They express, the term for that is ontological equality but economic subordination. Let's close in prayer. <laughs> Ten minutes, sir. <laughs> Let me explain that. Ontology means being. It means existence. All right? Ontology is a branch of philosophy that has to do with trying to figure out how things exist. When we take philosophical theology, you'll learn about ontology and epistemology. I, I, I mentioned to a friend once that a major focus of my study had been epistemology, and she said, I think my mom had that. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can ask the women what that means. <laughs> but ontological equality means equal in their existence, equal in being. None of them are more powerful or more important in their essence or being than the other two. The Father is not greater than the Son, who is not greater than the Spirit, who is not greater than the Father. So they are equal in their being, or their ontology. Okay? Now that you know what that means, you got a new word to play with. Go home. Play with your words. But economic subordination. What does this have to do with budgets and money and stuff? Uh, economy literally means how things are divided up. So you can understand how economics means finances, right? Because it means, with the resources you have, how does it get divided up? Where do you put stuff? That's what economy means, actually. We just have always tended to, we're used to thinking of it as only meaning money. But it means how you take what's available and divide it up. So economic subordination means that the way things are divided up amongst these three beings who are equal in their essence will be different. The sun, not because he's weaker or lesser, the Son willingly is subordinate to the will of the Father. The Holy Spirit is willingly subordinate to the will of the Son. Not because they're weaker or less or less important or anything else. In their essence, in their being, their ontology, they are equal. But they have different responsibilities which involve the Son and the Spirit choosing to be subordinate. Which basically means to be sent by and to try to fulfill the desires of. Okay, think about a human relationship. And I'm talking about a healthy human relationship. Carolyn and I, I think, have a healthy human relationship. It's always dangerous when I do this. <laughs> but when, when <laughs> Carolyn and I are together, and, um, and I take her a protein milkshake in the morning. I make one and I take it up to her. And she says, thank you so much. Did I do that because she's the boss? No, I didn't. Or in the evenings when she makes a pot of tea and brings me a cup of tea. Is it because I'm the boss? No, it's not. Carolyn handles the taxes. 
She deals with the bookkeeping and finances. I'm responsible for maintaining the house. Actually, Garrison Keillor, I think it was Garrison Keillor, uh, once said that men are only kept around because of uh, lawn care and vehicle maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> we each have accepted different responsibilities. If it's something having to do with taxes, it's Carolyn's job. We have agreed upon that. Not because I'm standing over her, hammering on her, or because I'm stronger, or whatever. You know, when I, I do most of the cooking. Not all, but most of the cooking. <laughs> When Carolyn, she cooked last night, when Carolyn cooks a meal, is it because all of a sudden she feels her weakness compared to me? No. She chose to do that. She chose in that case to subordinate herself to me. So whether it's an, a specific item or whether it's a whole group of activities, like the taxes or, you know, lawn care and vehicle maintenance, whatever it is, in those regards we choose to subordinate ourselves to one another in service. Not because one of us is stronger or meaner or, you know, maliciously taking advantage of the other. Well, that's a very weak analogy that conveys to the economic subordination of the Son to the Father and of the Spirit to the Father and the Son. They have certain jobs that they have being equal, agreed, is within their portfolio. That's what they do. Okay? Paul sort of talks about that in uh, Ephesians when he says... Chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, sealed by the Spirit. All of those are aspects of the salvation. Chosen, election, by the Father, redeemed, saved, by the Son, sealed as part of the body of Christ by the Spirit. All of them have some particular responsibility. The Holy Spirit did not save us on the cross. Jesus did that. The Son did that. And yet, it says, Scripture says, that we are justified, that the application of that salvation to our hearts and lives is made by the Holy Spirit. That's what the sealed by the Spirit means. So all three of those persons, beings, if you know, beings is a bad word, persons within the one God, the Trinity, they have separate responsibilities that they have chosen. And some of those are in subordination. The Son was sent by the Father, and as long as you're not Eastern Orthodox, the Spirit was sent by the Father and the Son. But that doesn't mean that one of them is weaker or lesser, or has less authority or less power or anything else. They are, in their essence, ontology equal, but they are willingly subordinate in how things get, get divided up, the economy. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Ontologically equal, economically in subordination to one another. That's, that's how they differ. That's why there's three persons within the one God. All equal, but with different responsibilities that they willingly accept. You know, that Jesus willingly accepted the will of the Father. But Graham the Gardner gets some of the You know, that also is true with you said uh, with your body, because each part of you, your body and your spirit, they all have a different function. Yeah, absolutely. And it fits. Yeah. But I, you know, the other thing is that I can I can understand the Father because I have one, and the Son because I have one. The Holy Spirit is a little more abstract. Yeah. And it's hard to put into the Trinity. It's true. For one thing, he doesn't have a name. Let's call him Bill. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's true, and that's not disrespectful, by the way. Yeah. Trust me. Uh, and yet there are some, uh, the, the human nature being what it is, we have so much tendency to focus on one or the other. You know, um, again, not to, den not to denigrate a whole, whole group of Christians, but there are some people within the charismatic and Pentecostal world, their whole focus is the Holy Spirit. They pray to the Holy Spirit, they talk about the Holy Spirit, they seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit, yeah. and, and you go, whoa, where's Jesus? Okay? And I think... The counter to that is that most of us Protestants don't have nearly enough of an understanding or an acknowledgement of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So somewhere between those two, there's truth. Mm -hmm. okay. If we didn't have it, we'd be having trouble, really trouble with this class. Exactly. We'd be having, <laughs> if you didn't have the Holy Spirit, we'd be having trouble with this class. <laughs> yes, Marvin. <laughs> you know, we use terminology like creator, redeemer, sustainer. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's legitimate. And yet, again, everything breaks down. When we say creator, redeemer, sustainer, both the Son and the Spirit were involved in creation as well. You know, all things were created through Him, the Son. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made, John 1. 
So, yeah, and we have to have those things. I mean, I'm not disagreeing with that because in order for us to be able to simply move forward with our understanding, we do have to have some categories, even though we, at the same time, have to recognize that those categories always inherently are going to be limited. Oh, you take it as a role. Yep. This is your role, this is your role, this is your Right. So, the only distinctions between the three persons of the Trinity are in how they relate to each other and to creation. Not power, not authority, not being co-eternal. Nothing, none of those other things have anything to do with it. It's how they relate to each other. You know that the, Father, the Son and the Spirit are subordinate to the Father. The Spirit is subordinate to the Father and the Son. And how they relate to creation. What are their jobs? What is the economic responsibility? How does it get divided up? Now, I'm, I'm going to skip this. Again, your book has a lot to do because we've only got one minute left. So, this, all of this is available online. You can pull this stuff up and spend time with these scripture verses. In fact, this is something that I use in our new members class. If you take our members class, some of the the attributes or characteristics, the, the part of the nature of God, are incommunicable, as Wayne Gruden calls them. Meaning, we aren't like that at all. We can't get there. You know, they're not, there's no part of us that's like that. They include the Trinity, uh, unless you believe, you know, mind, body, spirit kind of thing. Eternal, you know, there was a time when Ross was not. Okay, even though Jesus has always been. Infinite, I am distinctly finite. Almighty, not in my best days. Perfect, not hard. <laughs> Those are aspects or attributes of God that I cannot claim in any form. Then there is the, the idea of God who is transcendent and eminent. Actually, Grudem uses infinite and personal to reflect the same thing. And I think it's I don't think that's the best use of infinite. I think that's a different thing. You notice I have it elsewhere. Transcendent and eminent. Transcendent means God is above us. He's different than us. He's not like us. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our, our ways, Scripture says. God is God and we are not. He is transcendent from us. And yet, because He has chosen to be, not because He needs to be, He has chosen to be eminent. Eminent means close. God has chosen to come down to us, to communicate with us, to be available to us, to be personal to us. So God is both transcendent, holy God, not like us, but he has chosen to be eminent, personal, and close. I put that one in the middle because to me, transcendent and eminent, which are sort of two halves of the same coin, is where he starts being a little more like us. I'm not transcendent, and yet I can be eminent. I can be close. And then we have a series of characteristics, and this is not the, the whole list. I mean, we could come up with more. The top are the incommunicable or non-communicable, meaning I can't be like that. God cannot make us that. He can't communicate those to us in terms of our, our nature. The bottom ones are ways in which while I am not equal to God in those things, I am similar to God or I have a micro version of those characteristics. Spirit. God is spirit. And we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, I too have a spirit. In fact, C.S. Lewis says that all, all people are amphibians. We are spiritual beings in a physical body. We live in two worlds, like frog. And so I do have a spirit, although that spirit was created and the spirit that is God was not created. But I have a, something similar, creator. Well, I can't, make it, I can't create ex nihilo. I can't make things out of nothing like God did and does. But I can create things. I can create art. I can create ideas. So in that regard, I have a small version of that attribute of God creator. And, and these, by the way, I believe, when we talk about how we're made in the image of God, the way that we are made in the image of God are the communicable attributes. We have a version of what is God. As much as I love our dog, we had two until a, month, a year ago, unless, as much as I love my dog, I don't think I could ever consider him to be creative. God is creative, people are creative, because we're made in his image. No other creature is created in that way. Personal. Able to have a relationship person to person. Good. I'm not very good, but I know that there is good, and I can do good. Loving. 
I don't love perfectly as God does, but I am able to love. He has given me that ability. And so those are the ways, and, and more, the ways in which we are made in the image of God. This is not an exhaustive list, okay? Um, but, time's up. Bye, Barbara. <laughs> um, any last questions before I, I, I say goodbye for the week? I had sovereignty of God and a bunch of other things we were going to talk about, but I think we're okay. Read the book. This section, if you haven't finished it, this section of Bruno is one of his very best. I think. Now, it's a lot because he's comprehensive in his coverage, but that's a good thing. <laughs>